Okay, uh, I'm going to be all over the place in the scriptures today, unlike usual, but I'm going to be putting scriptures up on the, on the board, and uh, let's just pray before we get started in this. Father, we confess we need you, and, and Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would do the work that you want to do today. We don't want to just have a, uh, I know we're not about feel-good services, but we don't want to just have a feel-bad service either, Lord. We, we want to be the church. We want to hear what your Holy Spirit has to say to us. We want to be responsible as brothers and sisters in Christ for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in harm's way. And so, Lord, help us to just be responsible and show each one of us, and I know it might be different for each one, what would our part be? Some you're calling to pray. Some at this stage of their life, you just want to educate them. Some you're calling to give. Some you may be calling to go. I don't know, Lord. I just pray that you, you help us to hear from your Holy Spirit that it wouldn't be a guilt trip Sunday, but it would be a, a wake-up Sunday, that we hear from you and act appropriately. And we give you this time. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. By the way, I like what Voice of the Martyrs did here is they actually didn't just show you a bad story. It had a really great ending, didn't it? Not, not all of these have good endings, uh, but... But there's a lot. Of, the Lord redeems it. Romans 8, 28. We know that God calls us all things to work together for the good. To those who love him. To those who are called according to his purpose. And so he always turns it for his glory and for our good. And, and so I look forward to that as well. Well, we're going to go over a couple things. First of all, I want, you, I want to give you some facts. The, and, and some of the facts I want to give you right now as I'm looking on the web for updated information, I found something filled with information that's from 2013, but then I'm going to read some more modern stuff. So this here is from 2013. By the way, if you go to persecution.com, you could stay abre keep abreast on what's going on, and you could you know, read stories, watch videos, and learn how to pray for the persecuted brethren. So this is from 2013. Reports of Christians dying for their faith almost doubled between 2012 and 2013, with more Christians martyred in Syria in 2013 than worldwide in 2012. Just education. You need to know what's going on. Open Doors, a non-denominational group that supports persecuted Christians, said that 2,123 Christians were killed because of their faith in 2013, up from 1,201 last year. That 1,213 martyrs were recorded in Syria alone. Okay, one more older fact, and we're going to go to some newer ones. In 2013, the organization named North Korea as the most dangerous country for Christians for the 12th year in the row, followed by Somalia, Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. The U.S.-based group also said that Radical Islamists were the main source of persecution in many of the countries on the list, and that hostility towards Christians was increasing in Africa. That was 2013. Now we have ISIS. And if you've been watching the news and seeing what's happening, we're saying, oh, some of it's Islamic. It's incredible what's going on in the Islamic world, and you look at what ISIS does, and it's kind of obvious, I'm thinking, doesn't even the world, people who aren't believers, can't they see, it's, this is demonic. It's demonically inspired, demonically driven. In June of 2014, ISIS took control of Mosul and declared uh, caliphate in Syria and Iraq. In August of that year, 200,000 Christians had to flee their cities and villages in the Nineveh Plains. Now, by the way, I don't know if you've noticed, but there are a lot of refugees coming in to Boise. Boise is one of the main um, channels where the U.S. government is actually channeling the refugees to. And so I've got mixed feelings about this. Part of it is I'm thinking, you don't have to spend money to go around the world to reach them for the gospel. They're coming to us so we can preach the gospel to them. The other part of it is I wonder how many are, are using this as a cover and bringing in people who shouldn't be here to establish uh, Islamist terrorist groups in here. So I, I, I'm kind of torn on, is this good or bad? Well, it's both, actually. Just pray and ask the Lord to give you direction in this. In 2013, the organization, oh, I, I jumped to the wrong part. Here we go. Um, in 2015, ISIS started kidnapping Christians from their villages in North Syria. And to this day, many 
we don't have a, an exact count because it's, it's going up every day, have been raped, beheaded, threatened, under torture, beaten, and on and on and on. Now, one of the things I want to get across to you, in case you don't know, that persecution and martyrdom is really our history, okay? We have a rare window right now in America. It's been a strange time in history where to be a Christian has been a good thing. Um, but really, if you read church history, it's really, uh, it's our background of persecution and martyrdom. And I'm just going to read an excerpt to you now from what is uh, a famous book. You may have heard it. The, it's an excerpt from the Fox's Book of Martyrs. If you haven't read this book, or at least portions of it, I recommend it. It's another reality orientation. I'm going to get to the scriptures too, by the way, okay? He's not going to just read from other books. Well, I'm just to prime the pump. I'm going to get to the Word of God. You betcha. You know me. I'm not going to just teach from self-help books, okay? Or, or, or whatever, okay? But I want to read a rather large excerpt. And, and I really just downloaded this on my Kindle, and it's very cheap. You can actually electronically get copies, depending on what your preference is. So this is the, from the intro of Fox's Book of Martyrs. In Matthew 16, 18, it is recorded that Jesus told his disciples, I will build my church, and the gates of hell, Hades, shall not prevail against it. Three major points can be noted in Jesus' words. Now, I'm going to read it, but by the way, this is in your shepherd or sheep. I've put it in each of your bulletins if you, if you want a copy of this. One, Christ will have a church in this world. Two, his church will be mightily attacked. Three, none of the devil's attacks will destroy it. Looking back through the history of the church, we can see that Jesus' words have been fulfilled in every century. Its glorious history verifies his words. First, that there is a true church of of Christ in this world and without question. Second, every level of secular and religious leaders and their s subjects have publicly and forcefully, with every cunning deceitful means at their disposal, denounced and persecuted that true church. Third, that that church has endured and held its testimony of Christ through every attack brought against it. Its, its passage through the storms caused by violent anger and hate has been glorious to see. And much of its history is written in this book, and we're talking about the Fox's Book of Martyrs, so that the wonderful works of God might be to Christ's glory and that the, the knowledge of experiences of the church's martyrs have a beneficial effect upon its readers and strengthen their Christian faith. Now, I don't know what it does to you when you hear stories about martyrdom or even see that video that you just saw, but for me, it fires me up, okay? Uh, I, I really don't get scared by it. I don't go, oh, I hope, you know, when I was a kid, maybe, you know? And that's, that's, the, that's a tough thing for parents, how to educate your children. Because when you talk about true persecution and the, and the history of the church, how much do you put on them at once? Because a little child would be frightened, I don't want to die for Jesus, you know what I mean? But the older I get, the more I'm willing to die. <laughs> I was telling somebody earlier today, you know, I think uh, old age is God's way of making you willing to die. You know, as you, you go, no, I got plenty of juice left, you know, and as you get older, you go, okay, take me, you know. Uh, so maybe I'm just at that stage, okay, uh, that, that I kind of even imagine with the ISIS with their sword to my throat and what I would do and would I proclaim the name or would I say, here, I drew a dotted line for you, what would I do, you know. Because I, I want to be willing to do whatever it takes to follow Christ. If it, if it doesn't mean dying for him, at least it means living for him. Amen? Matter of fact, by the way, it is harder to live for him than die for him. And so I challenge you as we get through this to live for him. You may never have to die for him. But you, do, you are called to live for him. Let me do a quick run through of some of the first martyrs. And, and this, again, is from Fox's Book of Martyrs. I'm going to start a little in depth, and then I'm going to move quick, quicker as we go here. The first martyrs. Jesus, of course, uh, was the first to suffer for the church. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to just read it here. He, uh, he was not a martyr, of course, but the inspiration and source of all martyrdom. The story of his suffering and crucifixion is so well told in the Holy Scriptures that we have no need to document it here in the book. 
It's enough to say that his subsequent resurrection defeated the intent of the Jews and gave fresh courage and new direction to the hearts of his disciples. And after they received the power of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, which we're going to study next, they were further filled with the confidence and boldness they needed to proclaim his name. This new confidence and boldness completely confused the Jewish rulers and astonished all who heard them. Now, I'm gonna, the, the only one I'm going to go in depth is Stephen, and then move quick from there. So Stephen was the first martyr for, uh, after Christ. Let me just read it. Stephen, the second person to suffer and die for the church. He was martyred because... Uh, martyred because... To be, there's a typo here, to be faithful in the way that he proclaimed the gospel to those who had killed Jesus, they became so enraged at what he said to them that they drove him out of the city and stoned him to death. Stephen's martyrdom came about eight years after the Lord's crucifixion, which would place his death in the year A.D. 35. Now, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, when I, when I, was, I was trying to figure out what should I, I like visuals, so I wanted to kind of get a little, kind of like a painting or portrayal of each of the martyrs. I thought, I'm just not going to put all that up, okay? I don't want it to be gory service, okay? So we'll just keep whatever behind me here. The same hate generated against Stephen apparently brought great persecution to all who professed faith in Christ as the Messiah. And Luke writes, at that time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. And during that time, about 2,000 Christians were martyred. Now, I'm going to move quicker from here, but I want you to know, right from the very beginning, there were thousands who were martyred for Christ. And, uh, and, and if you're paying attention, there are more being martyred for Christ today than in the past. It's escalating. Do you see it? James, for instance, just the, what happened now, the, the foundation of the church. James, the elder brother of John, he was stoned to death in Jerusalem. Matthew was pinned to the ground and then beheaded in Ethiopia. They went out. They went out and preached the gospel, and they gave their lives for it. James, the brother of Jesus, and the writer of the epistle of James, he was stoned and beaten in. His head was beaten in with a, with a hammer, a blacksmith's hammer. Matthias, he was stoned to Jerusalem and then beheaded. Andrew, the brother of Peter, he was crucified on an X-shaped cross, which came to be known as the, 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 the St. Andrew's cross. You may have seen them before. Mark, tradition says he was dragged to pieces by the people of Alexandria. Peter, he felt like when he was arrested, he says, I'm not worthy <coughs> to be crucified. Cruc kill me in a different manner. So they crucified him upside down. Paul was beheaded in Rome. Jude was crucified in ancient Mesopotamia. Bartholomew was beaten and crucified in India. These guys went places. They did things. They made an impact for Christ, but they paid a high price for Christ. A couple more. Thomas was tortured in India, run through with spears, and thrown into the flames of an oven. Luke, there is disputed accounts of what happened to Luke, but uh, some say he was hung from an olive tree. Now, by the way, I'm going to read one more. I'm going to read John. We just finished the Gospel of John, review of John's background. But um, whenever I post my audios on our website, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I also post my notes. So if you want any of these excerpts, uh, you can go to our website after they're posted. It'll probably give us a day to post them. And usually you could click on the audio or click on the video or click on the PDF and actually download a copy of my notes, and all this information will be there for you. So you don't have to write so fast if some of you are going, well, I want to know how they all died, okay? John, the Apostle John, brother of James, is credited with founding the seven churches of Revelation. Smyrna, Pergamos. <coughs> Let me get a drink of water. <coughs> Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Thyatira, and Ephesus. It was from Ephesus, it is said, that he was arrested and sent to Rome where he was cast into a large vessel filled with boiling oil, and it didn't, har didn't harm him. You've heard the story? You know why he didn't boil. He wasn't a friar. Okay, go on. As a result, he was released and banished. I, I got to lighten it up somewhere, okay? As a result, he was released and banished by the emperor Domitian to the Isle of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation. 
after being released from Patmos, he returned to Ephesus, where he died about 98 AD. He was the only apostle to escape a violent death. Even with all the continual persecutions and violent deaths, the Lord added to the church daily. I, I want you to know this. It's the Romans 8:28 principle. No matter what happens to the church, no matter what happens to you, God is greater. And some of you right now, I'm not finished reading, but I always interrupt myself. It's okay. Some of you might think, oh, I could never do that. Let me tell you something. Have you ever heard of the saying, dying grace? When you find yourself in that situation, if you find yourself in that situation, the Lord is always faithful to give you the grace you need to face whatever situation comes up, whether it's imprisonment, whether it's uh, martyrdom, whether it's just being harassed at work or in the neighborhood. God will give you grace for it. Let me finish this now. The church was now deeply rooted in the doctrine of the apostles and watered abundantly with the blood of the saints. She was prepared for the cruel persecutions that were to come. You know, persecution has not and will not stop the gospel. And there's a saying, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the saints, uh, seed of the church. It, somehow, the more you try to silence the gospel, the more you try to kill those in the church, persecute them. The church, it, it seems that the church flourishes in those areas. And I'm of the personal conviction that where the church is allowed to grow and actually seem to be lifted up, like in the days of Constantine when Christianity was given a high rank, it tends to corrupt. When, if the emperor Constantine or anybody says, anybody who's a Christian, you're, you're a high, you know, you're in a high position. That's who I'm looking for to hire on my staff or to become a, a politician or become one of the ranking members of Constantine's cabinet. Well, everyone wants to be a Christian then. And it gets infiltrated by fakes. And, and you know, that wasn't necessarily the best thing that happened to the church when Constantine declared Christianity the, the religion of Rome. That's not always a good thing. I think that's what's happened to America. Can I just say that's my opinion? There's been a lot of good that's happened. There are a lot of good churches, but um, I think there's also a lot of watered-down, compromising churches, and I think they need to get back to the Word of God, and I promise you as your pastor, we're staying with the Word of God. And if it, if it <laughs> okay, I'm not looking for a pep rally. I'm just telling you, if, if it, it gets to the point where it's illegal to, to read certain sections of the scripture, well, then I'll do prison ministry, okay? I'm just telling you what it's going to take. We're going to hold to the Word of God, and I'm exhorting you to do the same thing. If, if someday it gets to the point where we go underground, we'll have home studies. We don't have a building to give up yet. It's easier for us, okay? So we're okay. We're going to be okay. And the Lord always comes out triumphant. And, and you know, it was Jesus who said, Matthew 16, 18, that on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. We win, folks. I'm just telling you. Have you read the end of the book? Just turn to the end sometime. Read it. It gets confusing and messed up, but we win, okay? So I just want to tell you, Jesus never fails. And if it were on our shoulders, it'd be over a long time ago, okay? It was up to, well, the Christians have to be strong. We just have to be, right. pull yourself up by your bootstraps. The church would have disappeared many years ago. But it's not up to us. It's up to Jesus. And Jesus chooses to work through us. Praise the Lord. And yes, I'll tell you, be strong. Keep faith. Walk with him, of course. But just know that really, in, in, the, end, in, in the end, it's all up to Jesus. And my hope, my confidence, my rest, my strength is in him. But you might say, well, but what can I do? And I hope you are. I hope you say, what, what can I do? What should I do? Uh, and so I'm going to give you a little outline. And I kind of gave a sneak peek to the men at the men's prayer breakfast yesterday. Uh, and we'll see how much time we have for this. But I'm going to give you a, a three-point plan of what we should do. Let me tell you what it is first, and then I'll fill in the gaps, okay? Number one, it's going to be take heed to yourself. Start with you. We'll talk about that. But the first thing you do isn't send money or start praying. It's start with you and your walk. We'll talk about that. Secondly, once you get yourself right with God, it's remember the suffering. Remember those who are, who are suffering. And third is ready your heart for suffering. 
Ask the Lord to give you, get you to the place where whatever comes your way, you're, you're going to take it and you're, gonna, you're willing to suffer for him. Okay? So those are the three points. Let's see how far we get through them. And now if, if we don't finish them, I'll say, well, yeah, I gave you the points. Okay? Or you can download my notes. So <clears throat> take heed to yourself and your walk. And, and all I'm saying is live as a new creature in Christ and, and be what God has called you to be. Be what God has made you. I'm not saying be a Christian. You are a Christian. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you're born again. He's given you a new nature. Now be who you are. Don't act like the world. Don't, don't follow their example. Be what God has made you to be and rise up. And th what that means is godly priorities, godly values. Now I'm going to ask you, because I'm all over the place and I don't have a main text, let me at least give you one text to turn to, okay? Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And if you want to stay there, fine. If you want to keep up with me, have fun. But 1 Timothy <clears throat> chapter 6, and this is the section of Scripture where, where Timothy, or Paul writes to Timothy, he says, Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. What does that mean? Well, I want to look at the context of that. When, when, when you're told, fight the good fight of faith, we're going to look at the context of it. 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting with verse 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, <clears throat> it is certain we will carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Now pay attention, because we're told warnings to be careful of your heart being swayed towards things. We're also being told, we'll be told today things that you should be doing, things you shouldn't be doing, but it's not legalism. I'm not going to put up a big list of things not to do and things to do. Listen to the Word of God and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, Paul writes to Timothy, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness. Stop there. You notice he's saying, flee this, pursue that. Watch for this in the scripture. Quite often you see the scripture will say, you know, don't, don't steal from one another, but instead work with your hands. It'll, it'll tell you what not to do, but what to replace it with. You know, you know how it works when you try to not do something? <laughs> like, you know, don't think of a red horse. Yeah, now you're all thinking of a red horse, you know. So, so I, I'm grateful to the Word of God that we're told, don't do this, but instead do that. And you see it right here is one example. Uh, flee these things, but pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Now, normally, if we're teaching through the text, I'd take some time and define each one, but I got a lot of ground to cover today. Normally, I'd want to get into the Greek and get on. Just forgive me. We're going to, we got a lot of ground to cover. And this is where Paul says to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold of eternal life to which you were also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And so, first of all, if, the, if you don't notice anything else in this text, realize there's a fight to fight. Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's not just... I'm just going wherever the train takes me. You fall off the, I'm going to fall off the stage. I keep going that direction. But there's a fight to fight. There's a battle to win. And God has a war for you to win. And he's equipped you, he's equipped you with all the tools and, and, and the armor of God. And, and we've covered that in, in years past, the armor of God. But he's, he's equipped you, and there's a fight to fight. And Paul says to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. So let me read another from James chapter 1. And this is where we went yesterday, and boy, uh, uh, I went so long on that one, and James chapter 1, that uh, I never got to the other points, but with, there's so much good stuff in here. James chapter 1, verse 26, James says, if anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. But pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. God help me to focus in on just what you want said on this text because there's so much here. Let me just tell you, people talk about, yeah, I'm religious, you're religious. What is relig what's true religion in the sight of God? Can I say there's two parts to it? The first is what you do, and the other is what you don't do. 
Some people make it all about doing, doing. You've got to work your way. It's all about what you do. Some make it all about what you don't do. I don't, my, my pastor in California used to say, I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go with girls who do. You know? <laughs> it's what you don't do that makes you good. Well, I want you to notice that um, James is saying there's two parts to this. True religion in the sight of God is, yes, there's a good work for you to do. And, and so he talks about visiting orphans and widows and their distress. And by the way, I got off on this yesterday. I, I want to start up a convalescent ministry in Eagle. We've got some going in Boise and other areas. And, and I just think it's time. If you're interested, let me know. I'll go with you. We'll get started. Uh, we, I want to get more prison ministry going, convalescent ministry. Orphans and widows in their distress. There's even an orphanage in Eagle. Do you know, you know that? It's a little different. A lot hard to explain. But what... Basically, what James is saying is, help the helpless. Do something to help the helpless. Do something to bless somebody that you're not going to get something back from it. You know, if I'm good to them, they'll be good to me, you know. No. Help those less fortunate than yourself and help the helpless. And, and then he says, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. There is a part of Christianity that the Lord shows us, you know what, I, I need to stay away from that. That's sin. That's sin. I need to not be, I used to hang out at the bars. I used to party. I used to, I didn't actually used to do that, but I, you might be saying that. I actually was a, I had other sins, okay? You know, and you could say, you know, I, I used to sleep around. I used to be into porn. You know, all the, all the sins, but you need to, there is a, a keeping yourself unspotted by the world. But there's two parts to it, you notice? There's doing something positive, and then, of course, staying away from the things that will destroy you spiritually. You know, the, the sins that are listed in the scripture, he didn't, God doesn't give you a list of sin because he doesn't want you to have any fun. And, and, and what is it? Um, what one person uh, often says is, uh, it's not bad because it's sin. It's, it's sin because it's bad for you. It's sin because it harms you. And so when God tells you to stay away from something, it's for your own good. That's another series we'll go and do sometime, Okay. So, number one, take heed to yourself. You can't do good for anybody else until you're first walk, walking with the Lord. Don't think you could ignore this, not walk with the Lord, and just put, send money to the hurting Christians. No, God is calling you to start living for Him and repent from your sins and live right and be a Christian, okay? So we've got we to cover that first. Once you get that straight, then number two is remember your suffering brethren. Remember, though, as a matter of fact, the, the verse I chose for this is Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3, where the writer of Hebrews says, Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Now, there's a great principle. Remember them as if you were them. So think about it. What would you want if you were in prison for your faith, if you were suffering for your faith, what would you like your, your family in Christ to do for you? You know, at least pray for you, right? Maybe if, if you could, visit. visit. You know, we have prison ministers, a great ministry. There are brothers and sisters behind bars who they were some of the most blessed ministry I've ever been involved in is prison ministry. You think it's scary? It's not. They are so glad you came to see them. There's hospital visitations. There's letters. Write letters. You, oh, I can't go to Iran. Well, you could write letters. Every now and then they'll put something up there and they say, Write a letter to Saeed or write a letter to others. You could write letters. What would you want if you were behind bars? One of the little short clips that I was going to show you is a man who spent years and years and years in prison. He was over 10 years in prison for his faith. And, and Christians found out about it and sent letters. And the guard who was watching over him, the, the prison warden, came in there with a bushel of letters and says, What is this? What is and he threw it on the floor. And of course, he was speaking another language. And he's yelling and beating him, and, and, and the prisoner was all upset. Um, the, the, the Christian man was going, okay, he's beating me and everything because all these letters were written, and then he went to his, his prison cell and smiled. He never got to read any of them. He just saw there was all these letters. All these people remembered me. All these people wrote me. Even if you go, well, why write? Because never, he's never going to read it. Write. Do something. Petitions. You know what? I, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to put a big trip on you, but I'm telling you, every time in my email, and some of it is weird, some stuff is 
false. Sometimes they want you to do a petition for something that's not even real. I always check it out and make sure it's real. But when I know it's real, I will send a letter to the congressman. I will sign the petitions. I will make a phone call. I will do what it takes for my suffering brethren. Can you do that? You can. Let me just encourage you. Education, motivation. That's what we're doing today. Not a guilt trip, but what could you do? Next time somebody sends something uh, in the email to you and you could, you could at least sign a petition or you could make a phone call, do it. We could do that. Remember your brethren. That's what Hebrews 13.3 says, as if you were in that spot. I think that's good. And there's probably more, but I'm not going to go through a big long list because I want to talk next, number three, about you being ready for whatever lies ahead. Now, can I say... Well, let's see, do I have that verse in here somewhere? Probably at the last, huh? Yeah, it's the last one. I'm going to throw you off, Darren, doing PowerPoint. But let me just start with this. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So of some kind or another, even if it's people kind of ragging on you, it's, if you're not suffering any kind of persecution, something's wrong. Maybe you're not being a light. If the darkness isn't yiping, maybe you're not being a light. Maybe you're just like them. Maybe at work or at school or wherever you are, if, if you blend right in and there's no problem, check yourself. Okay? Because the Scripture promises that if you desire to live godly, it doesn't say, yea. Let me look at that again. Uh, yes, all who have said the sinner's prayer will suffer persecution. No. You could say the sinner's prayer. That doesn't mean anything. You could just be going through the motions. Yes, all who've gone forward at an altar call will suck now. You could still be secret. You could not even be saved. But all who desire, listen to this, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, if you really desire to live as God's called you to live, you're going to get hit because the devil doesn't like it. I told you it's demonic. It's demonic. And all those who are not submitted to Christ or any who are maybe even kind of open to the enemy, they're going to hate you. And they're going to find ways to attack you. Whether it's on the low level of just gossip or, or you know, uh, prejudice in job promotions. I had that when I was in the printing trade. There, I've seen all the people who got promoted over me were the boss's drinking partners, you know. And I just kept thinking, well, that's not my final place, man. I'm, I've got... God's called me to ministry. Let them all get promoted because they're going to be here the rest of their life. Ha <laughs> ha. You know. I had a way to f work through it, you know. You know. God bless you. You know, I trained you. Now you're my boss. Praise the Lord. See ya. Because I'm going, I got other plans. God's calling me somewhere else. But one way or another, you can experience it. Whether it's the politics at your job or your family or, or, or beatings, it just, you know, it goes up from there. So let me, we'll see how far we get. I got a bunch of scriptures. And let's go over a couple of principles about you preparing your heart for persecution. And you might think, it ain't going to happen to me. Well, let's hear what the scripture says. First Peter chapter 2, verse 19, Peter says this, For it is commendable... If because of conscience towards God, one endures grief, suffering, wrongfully, for what credit is it when you are beaten for your thoughts, if you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, and if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Let me stop there and say, there's two kinds of suffering. Well, there's probably more, but let me just divide it into two for now. You could suffer because you did something stupid. Well, that's, I could think of financial examples for that. You could suffer because you did something wrong. I went to jail because I'm, I'm a Christian. No, you went to jail because you stole something, okay? There, I've met people who are on a persecution complex, and really they deserve what they got, okay? So uh, Peter is saying, you know, if, if you do something wrong and you suffer for it, what good is that? But if you do what is right and you suffer for being a Christian... That's commendable before God. That means God is smiling at you and saying, my son, my daughter, I'm with you. Where did I leave off? For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Now let me just say this. It doesn't mean you've got to purposely suffer. You know, some people in the dark ages, they'd take it out and they'd be whipping themselves. I've got to suffer for Christ. I'll sleep on a bed of nails. I'll walk barefoot through thorns. No, 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 no. 
You don't have to look for it. It's going to come to you, okay? If you seek to live godly in Christ Jesus, that's what, what we already read, is that if you seek to live godly in Christ Jesus, it'll come in one form or another. Don't have to look for it. You don't have to punish yourself as others have in church history. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid for their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is within you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience. This is a long sentence. That when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. There's finally the end of the sentence. you got to take a couple breaths in that one. But, but here's the thing. We're told that we need to be ready to give a defense, ready to give an answer for the faith. And yet, notice it says, with meekness and fear. Well, I've, I've seen people love to just, you atheists are stupid, or you, they go to the cults and they just, they just look for a fight. We need to be Christ to the world. We need to answer as Christ would answer. We need to be willing to take whatever comes our way and always ready to give an answer. And, and, and so that means you need to know your Bible, huh? That means you need to do some study sometimes. Maybe, my mind's going all over the place here, maybe you, you go to a school and you're surrounded by evolutionists and they think you are a nut job. And maybe you need to just kind of read up and study and give, give a, an answer of some, from some educated people who don't believe in evolution. By the way, you figured it out by now I don't. Um, by the way, uh, my, my starting point, point for that is everybody believes in a miracle. Everybody. The evolutionist or the creationist. I'm getting off here. Help me, Lord. But the, evo the creationists believe that God created all things. The evolutionists believe that nothing created all things. They believe that nothing blew up and then we got something, okay? You can't escape it. Everybody believes in a miracle. So take a pick which miracle you want to believe in, okay? I think I got the right one. Anyway. Okay. Where did I leave off with this one? For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Isn't that what Peter's been saying in the chapter before? For Christ also suffered once for sins the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. If our Lord and Savior set the path and, and died for us, he set the example. Now, we don't have to die for our sins, praise the Lord. We don't have to die for somebody else's salvation or their sins, praise the Lord. But if our, if our Lord and Savior died, and that's how, I mean, he ended on the cross. Well, he didn't end. He ended at the resurrection. As a matter of fact, he didn't end at all. He's still alive, okay? So I guess we got to keep in mind there is no end. So we must not fear death because we don't end. We keep going. And, and, but not be afraid of whatever the world throws at you. Ready yourself. Okay, remember, I'm talking about make sure you're walking with the Lord. Number two is remember your suffering brethren. But number three is Prepare your heart for whatever comes your way. And then you'll be, you'll be approaching this whole persecuted church properly, I believe, if you take these three steps of instruction. One more, and it's in 1 Peter 4. There's a lot in 1 Peter. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, I'm reading in verse 14, blessed are you, for the spirit and glory of God rest upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody on others' matters. Remember I told you, there's, you could do it the right way or the wrong way. You could suffer because you, you brought it upon yourself. So be careful. I've seen people, Christians really irritate me when they say, you yeah, know, I'm being persecuted for Christ. When you dig into it and you find out they're just being obnoxious at work. They're, they're just being annoying. They're, they're being persecuted because they're annoying. Okay? You, you know, you can be persecuted for being annoying. But don't. If you're going to be persecuted, let it be because you're being Christ-like. So that's what, that's what Peter's saying here. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin with the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? 
Now if the righteous one, now if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer, listen to this last line, and then we're going to have communion. We'll see if we have time for a video. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Did you catch that word, that phrase, suffer according to the will of God? Some of you right now, you're suffering according to the will of God. There's all different ways I could go down a list, but... If you're obeying the Lord and being faithful to Him, whether it's at, jo at the job you're being uh, persecuted or there's prejudice or politics, in your marriage, maybe your husband or your wife is mistreating you and you're, and you're suffering because you're being Christ-like and they're not. There's all kinds. We can go down a list. There's all kinds of ways to suffer according to the will of God. Because I don't think the will of God is always, or rarely actually, huh, they're a problem. Let's wipe them out, how some have looked at it. I think there's times to take it on the chin, be a man of God, be a woman of God, and be willing to suffer according to the will of God. And it says, if that's the case, commit your souls to him in doing good. The Lord's speaking prophetically right now. The Lord's speaking personally to some of you right now. Because some of you, and it maybe has nothing to do with the persecuted church, but some of you are hurting really bad in your life right now. Maybe nobody knows. Are you suffering according to the will of God? Is it because you're walking with him? If that's the case, take note of what the Holy Spirit says to you right now. It says, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator.